Taylor Briggs in San Francisco and for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, zapping bugs. Apple overhauls its software testing after the iPhone 11 launch was riddled with bugs. We'll have details. Plus, later, Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates on how tech R&D is being seriously hampered by ongoing U.S.-China trade tensions. His comments from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. And electric fever. Tesla is set to unveil its electric pickup truck. We'll have the latest. But, but first to our top story. So Apple is overhauling how it tests software. Bloomberg has learned the system is changing after a swarm of bugs marred the latest iPhone and iPad operating systems. The goal is to make it easier to spot problems earlier. And this comes one day after President Trump's visit to Apple's Austin, Texas factory, where CEO Tim Cook met the president to discuss keeping Macs and iPhones free from tariffs. For more, let's bring in DA Davidson analyst Tom Forte and Bloomberg Technologies Mark Gurman. So Mark, give me the update. What do we know? About about the software change. So basically, Apple's iOS software has been buggy the past few years. This particular release cycle with iOS 13, macOS Catalina, the HomePod speaker software update have been especially buggy. What Apple's doing is they're going to make it so engineers earlier in the process will be able to determine what's buggy, what's working, what's not working, in order to hopefully, in their minds, come up with a much more stable operating system when they ship each September. Tom, I know that you cover the fundamentals of the business. In your opinion, when you analyze the company, at what point do you have to start to take a look at these software glitches and incorporate them into your analysis? Well, I think, you know, to the point that it has a dampening impact on unit sales for the company. So if you think about Apple, they have had some snafus over time with their technology, and it's not unusual for them to have issues with their software. Uh, the challenge here, though, is if you think about both uh, new iPhone users and then old iPhone users who upgrade to the latest software, uh, it's really part of that you know, feel for the consumer of having the latest and greatest Apple technology. So it's definitely something they need to improve. But uh, when it has an impact on unit sales, that's when I get real concerned about it. So, Mark, I'm curious, in your opinion, you have seen Apple come out with these glitches and have to quickly issue new updates. Is it better to do that, to get it out to the customer first, as Tom was alluding to, or would you prefer to see the company sit back and roll it out right the first time? Well, I mean, they really don't have an option but to get them out at the, at the proper time each year, right? They have to introduce it every June, and they have to release it every September because, to Tom's point, iPhone unit sales, selling new devices is the most important thing. The way these new devices are developed is they're built concurrently with the software updates, right? So it would be impossible to, let's say, ship the iPhone 11 without iOS 13. So they really have no choice. So it's not a matter of if they should or if they shouldn't. There's really no option here besides mm -hmm. adding fewer features, which of course they're not going to do because the features are what drive sales. Tom, I want to switch gears and talk about uh, Tim Cook's visit with Trump yesterday at Apple's new factory in Austin, Texas. Broadly, as you take a look at Apple and Tim Cook's relationship with Trump, is Tim Cook and Apple doing the right thing by getting in front of the president, getting the president's ear, showing off new factories, even though it's small in Apple's terms? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. So I would argue that no publicly traded CEO has done a better job managing uh, the relationship of the company with the president than Tim Cook has for Apple. And I think you see that in the recent uh, tariff to the extent that they adjusted the timing of it, which essentially gave Apple an opportunity to sell its new iPhones one more time without the full impact of tariffs. So I think that Tim Cook's done an amazing job. It's interesting to do a compare contrast if you want to on how he's done versus Jeff Bezos and Amazon. And I think most recently, if you look at the Jedi contract that Amazon lost, suggests that Tim Cook's doing a much better job than Jeff Bezos and Amazon. So I think Apple's doing a great job managing its relationship with the president and Tim Cook's leading that charge. Mark, react to that. Is Tim Cook doing the best of all big tech CEOs? 
I mean, I would agree that Tim Cook is doing what he needs to do from a bottom line perspective, from a financial perspective. Like Tom said, that he did get the tariffs on the iPhone delayed. And we'll see if this, you know, dog and pony show yesterday plays into Apple either getting a waiver or a further delay on smartphone products. But at the end of the day, what they showed yesterday was, was not new in any way. They framed it as some sort of big launch. Uh, it's important to note this factory, those engineers, everything that you, we saw yesterday, everything you see on the screen right now, has been in place since 2013. So this is not new by any means. This is a seven-year-old uh, existing infrastructure that has basically been portrayed as a new thing. Uh, and they're going ahead and you know thanking the Trump administration for this. On, on top of that, this is not the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple Watch, right? This is Apple's lowest volume product that they sell. So the impact that this would have had on Apple's bottom line if this was a tariff product they produced in China would have been so slim anyways. So it's really unclear what Apple's winning by doing this other than bidding in this PR situation with the Trump administration in order to help prevent tariffs on other products like the iPhones moving forward, which of course is a smart business decision, but it's a bad PR move in the interim. Well, Tom, within the PR machine that is Apple, is the political savviness of Tim Cook undervalued asset? Is that not being reflected in the share price? Well, you know, with the rebound in shares, it's hard to indicate what is not in the share price. Um, so I do think the company, again, Tim Cook at the charge, has done an amazing job as the smartphone market has matured in starting to diversify its revenue base. Uh, you think about what they're doing with all their other hardware devices, including wearables, the uh, watches. And then what we look at in particular is either the proprietary content or things they're doing in financial services, such as both Apple Pay and Apple Card, and then also healthcare. So I do think that uh, it is reflected in shares and it is warranted. I think it's done an amazing job managing uh, the current administration and uh, it should be positively reflected in the price. Tom, what's your base case scenario when it comes to tariffs? Great question. So if you think about, so I'll give a quick example of Sonos, which is another company I covered that indicated they're moving all their production into Malaysia and out of China. So I think the base case is that you're going to see more companies that are going to move their uh, manufacturing operations out of China. In the case of Apple, Apple may never be able to move its smartphone uh, manufacturing out of China, but it may be able to have more of its parts manufacturers move their own uh, supply chains out of China which could help it avoid some of the tariffs in addition to uh, Tim Cook's efforts to manage the uh, administration there. Mark, I want to switch gears a little bit as well because we saw some technical glitches when Disney was trying to become a tech company and had to keep up with password thieves and password hackers. You've had Apple TV Plus now, a tech company, have some glitches when it comes to the rollout of their films, one of which they had to pull back. Is Apple TV Plus prepared to be a media company? Uh, yes, you know, I think Apple's infrastructure for video streaming, the application development that it's had for a number of years has been there. So I think Apple, you know, their cloud infrastructure on the consumer side isn't normally great, but I think there's really been no glitches. It's really been problem free in terms of the rollout of new shows. Uh, I mean, I've seen this myself on my Apple products. Every time a new episode hits at midnight Friday, Eastern time, you know, you get a buzz on your phone that a new episode is available. It's ready to stream immediately. Uh, so I think their experience in, in the app store and distribution like iTunes movie rentals has really prepared them for this. Uh, password management has been a big focus for Apple for the last few years. Apple TV Plus is tied directly into family sharing. Uh, so, I mean, you can use TV Plus on that subscription, either free or five bucks a month with four other family members. So from a technology perspective, TV Plus really has been problem free so far, I would say. That was Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and D.A. Davidson's Tom Forte. And long-anticipated job cuts have begun at WeWork. The struggling office sharing company says the cuts will affect 2,400 employees. That is almost 20% of its workforce. WeWork is seeking to stabilize its business and show a path to profitability. The company scrapped an IPO and needed a bailout from SoftBank to stay afloat. And coming up, switching gears, Google gets in on the political ads debate. We'll break down how the search giant is prepping for the 2020 election. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Twitter is taking steps to improve the health of discussions and interactions on the service. The social media platform will start letting all users hide replies to the tweets they send. The change provides a degree of control that could keep spammers away. It also could hide hateful or inappropriate replies. However, the hidden replies can be revealed by clicking a button. And sticking with social media, Google is jumping into the online political ad debate. Google is limiting how political advertisers can target people online. It will no longer allow election ads to be targeted based on political affiliation on Google search, YouTube, and across the web. Google is also restricting misinformation and blocking deep fakes. This comes as Facebook holds strong to its existing political policies, though one executive indicated to Axios that the company may still limit political ads in the same matter. To discuss is Bloomberg Technologies' Eric Newcomer and Kurt Wagner here with me in studio. So Kurt, break down for me what we know about Google's policies and how they differ from Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, you mentioned a few of the restrictions on ad targeting, specifically political affiliation. So you couldn't uh, target just to Democrats or Republicans. But I think the real important part here is that both Google and Facebook have a product. They're, they're named differently, but basically it allows a politician to upload a bunch of email addresses or phone numbers and then target those people on the surface. Uh, Google calls it customer match. Facebook calls it custom audiences. Google's getting rid of that for political ads and that's a big deal because again a lot of these politicians build these rosters of potential voters and supporters that they want to reach continuously. Uh, Facebook still offers that right now and that is kind of the um, in my opinion maybe the most important uh, targeting element of this whole thing. Eric, as it comes down to Google, what will be the impact on some of the campaigns? You know, I, I think a lot of that is still to be seen. You know, what what they can do to sort of work within the rules. But, uh, you know, Facebook has been sort of in the headlines when you think of political advertising, obviously got super tied up in the 2016 election. But Google is really important here. You know, they have YouTube search ads are influential, and there has been this power uh, to target people, which is what gives online advertising sort of its oomph. And so I, I think we're going to have to see how the campaigns react. I mean, as long as Facebook is holding out, there's a question of whether spending shifts over to where people can still target uh, their audiences. But it, it's a pretty significant decision. Kurt, Eric stole my thunder. That was <laughs> has to be the next question is now, doesn't it make sense where we all just advertise on Facebook because we're not uh, con uh, combined or confounded to, to, to what we say? I think if that is the uh, approach around, again, uploading these custom audiences, yeah, of course, you're going to go to the place that still offers that feature, which in this case is Facebook, not Google. So I do think that, you know, right now on paper, Facebook kind of uh, stands to benefit a little bit by Google's decision uh, if a lot of this money that would have gone pro probably more to YouTube even than Google search because uh, that's a little bit I think more um, targeted in terms of again these emails and phone numbers but if you take that money and you say okay well we can't reach voters in the way that we were planning to uh, Facebook is is now probably the best option. Well and Kurt yesterday in your tweet when you were discussing this story yeah. and analyzing it you said that um on one hand, the Trump administration in 2016 had been very good at this, had used this, and was effective at it. Does that continue? Yeah, I mean, that was part of the big story after 2016 was uh, President Trump's uh, and his campaign success on Facebook in particular. Um, you know, our colleague Sarah Fryer wrote a really good story last year. She got her hands on some internal documents that Facebook had uh, reviewed, basically, his performance during the campaign from an ad standpoint and found that he was testing thousands of different, or millions, I'm sorry, of different ad formats to different people. So really trying to figure out what message works with what group of people and then really hammering home those messages to those individual cohorts. And I think that, again, is the whole point of this targeted advertising, as Eric mentioned, is that you can really get very granular and very specific. So the more they take that away, the harder it is going to be to uh, you know, really get in on a, on a granular level. Eric, I know it's very, very early days, but we're coming off the Democratic debates last night. Any sense within the big tech where the majority of ad spending has been going and what campaigns Democrats or Republicans have been really utilizing that tool as we ramp up to 2020? Well, you know, we've seen funny examples with Elizabeth Warren spending on Facebook to antagonize Facebook. I mean, I think there's been concern on the Democratic side that Trump has gotten out ahead and you know, as since he can spend for, you know, the whole Republican Party in the presidential race, he's spending more aggressively than any individual 
Democratic candidate. So I think that's a concern. And you've seen, you know, efforts from the Democrats, a uh, group uh, what David Pluff is affiliated with, trying to find ways to counterbalance that. But, but like you said, I mean, it's still early. And, you know, part of the problem of ha the Democrats having sort of a primary is that they're competing with each other at the moment, while Trump sort of has this time to position himself uh, with potential voters. Kurt, we came off of a previous segment where we were talking about Tim Cook's relationship with President Trump mm -hmm. and of all of big tech and Tom Ford, Dave D.A. Davidson said really of any big company right now, he has the best relationship. Where does Mark Zuckerberg stand in terms of a relationship with President Trump? Uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it's not something that they talk about, uh, they being Facebook, the company. Uh, we just found out today, for example, that he had dinner with President Trump in D.C. Uh, they had previously had a closed door meeting in the Oval Office. Um, I believe that was even uh, just about a month before the dinner. So just twice in the last uh, couple months, they've met face to face. But again, Facebook doesn't really talk about this. He's certainly not on TV in the way that Tim Cook was with President Trump yesterday. He's also not being antagonized in the way that, you know, Jeff Bezos of Amazon might be. Trump is not attacking uh, Mark Zuckerberg in the same way on Twitter and other social platforms. So I imagine he must be somewhere uh, sort of in the middle, but it is telling that Facebook doesn't necessarily want people to know when he's meeting with the president and what they are discussing. The intersection of technology and politics continues thanks to our Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner and Eric Newcomer. And coming up earlier this week, Moffat Nathanson downgraded AT&T to a sell with a $30 price target. We speak to analyst Craig Moffat on concerns about the company next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. If Facebook or any other tech giant wants to start a bank, it should be ready for an army of government minders. The head of the FDIC, Jelena McWilliams, jokes that she has 6,000 employees and says, quote, we can hire 6,000 more to regulate the heck out of you. Tech firms have yet to make an incursion into old school banking. More common is what Goldman Sachs has done. It's backing an Apple branded credit card and regulators are investigating whether the computer models Goldman uses to determine credit limits are biased. Now, AT&T got a rare sell rating this week as analyst Craig Moffat of Moffat Nathanson projects weakness for the company, particularly with falling subscribers and video revenue at the company's entertainment group. On top of that, falling ratings at Warner Media. And then there's the upcoming launch of the HBO Max streaming video service. And is HBO's OTT network enough to help the company fight its way back into the streaming wars? Craig Moffat of Moffat Nathanson joins us now over the phone. Um, Craig, I loved your 42-page report. I admit, I read it cover to cover, and what struck me is Turner Media is about 20% of revenue, and that does include that HBO service. Where does HBO fit in for you in the middle of the streaming wars? Hi, Taylor. Well, well, you know, HBO, I think, look, it looks like a really good product if you're a consumer. That's not the issue, and I, and, and I give them some credit. They've done a very nice job. Uh, making it a compelling offering. The problem for AT&T is you're taking three businesses within, within Warner Media. That is, you're taking the Turner Networks, you're taking HBO, and you're taking the Warner Brothers Studio, and you're collapsing them into one business, HBO Max. Um, that's a bit of an overstatement, but they're working in that direction. Um, and so there is a very real risk here that one plus one plus one is going to equal one and that you'll have a good HBO business, but you will have burned down Turner and the TV studio in the process. Craig, an analyst over at KeyBank Security said that he'd been analyzing some of the early data out of HBO and they were looking at some subscriber losses because of the end of Game of Thrones. Are you too forecasting some subscriber losses given the increased competitive environment? Well, I, the, the idea that they might have lost some subscribers in their traditional model in advance of this because, of the end, uh, because Game of Thrones rolled off isn't really a surprise. And I think that's probably not, uh, certainly not the main theme of what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is broader, which is, let's zoom out for a second. As much trouble as they're having in the, the 
Warner Media business. Um, part of that is a function of just look, the Turner networks um, are in the midst of a cord cutting cycle where distribution of cable networks is falling three and a half percent a year, and the entertainment networks are worse. So Turner's ratings are down in the mid in the high teens to the low twenties. Um, year over year. So you're seeing pressure not only on affiliate fees, which is what they get paid by the distributors, but also in advertising because they're getting so much, uh, so many fewer eyeballs. So you're seeing all kinds of pressure on these media businesses. Separately, you're seeing a tremendous amount of pressure in the direct TV business where they spent 2019 doing everything that they could to keep the wheels on the, the business by raising prices to offset subscriber declines. Well, what happens when you raise prices in a business that is suffering subscriber declines? The subscriber declines just get worse. And so the following year is even harder. And so you have all of these building pressures for 2020 and beyond um, that are, I think, in, in the beginning of next year, going to be too difficult for investors to ignore like they did through most of, of 2019. Craig, you called the entertainment group a cancer. What do they have to do to reverse that? It's awfully hard to see. These are not, it would be nice if you just said they're just not managing it very well and therefore they could manage it better. But this is not an issue of the assets not being managed well. This is an issue of it's not a good asset. You've got, they, they paid $67 billion for DirecTV um, just, what, five and a half years ago now. Um, and that business has is now seeing subscribers falling, at least notionally year over year, by uh, by about uh, 13 percent. But but in fact, the the decline rate in the most recent quarter annualizes to a decline rate of more than 20 percent a year in the subscriber base. Revenues obviously fall with subscribers, margins mm -hmm. fall with revenues, and so that's a business that. In addition to having lost something like 20 to 25 mm -hmm. percent of the EBITDA since they bought it, it, would probably command a multiple that's less than half of the multiple they got when they bought it. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you to Moffitt Nathanson's Craig Moffitt. And still ahead from Beijing, Bill Gates shares his views on climate change and the tension between the U.S. and China. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. At the New Economy Forum Bloomberg event in Beijing, tech pioneer Bill Gates spoke with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite about a number of issues, among them U.S.-China relations, the evolving energy sector, climate change, and whether carbon tax will happen in the U.S. There's no doubt that uh, solar and wind, uh, including offshore wind, will be a huge part of that. Because those are intermittent sources, the need either for 24-hour sources like nuclear or unbelievable miracle in terms of both transmission and storage uh, is very, very high. You, know, you can look at a country like Japan, uh, Tokyo, 60 gigawatts. Uh, you have seven days where you have no wind or sun power at all. So you have to say to yourself, if you're not going to have people freeze to death, what is the source of energy during that seven-day period. The U.S. Midwest, you have long periods uh, where a cold front sits on it and the wind doesn't blow. So it'll be a lot of renewables uh, and either a storage miracle or, or quite a bit of uh, nuclear. The electric source will be almost three times as big because it'll be taking over parts of transport and industrial and heating that historically went to direct hard hydrocarbon usage. Anyway, people building models of that future grid, different uh, universities, you know, different people picking their choices, that will be the sign that not only do we have a goal to be there by 2050, but we're debating the paths and very concrete plans. You know, when you see things like a 15% diesel tax, you know, create unrest, the willingness to make the type of change and investment in this, you can question whether it's there because the free rider problem has never been worse uh, than it is in, in climate, particularly for middle income countries that can appropriately argue that the historical emissions of the rich countries 
uh, mean they get to wait till per person they emitted as, as much as we have. Do you think a carbon tax is the way to secure that? I mean, you've set, you pointed to the political difficulties of that, but well, from, that is the most, that's the fairest way to do it. Yeah, that's a way to do it. Uh, if you look at the U.S. in particular, I don't think it's likely to happen. And so, you know, we've had tax credits on renewables. We've had renewable portfolio standards. You can get there in a way that's less uh, neutral. Uh, there's a variety of regulations and helping nascent sectors, you know, certainly what's happened with solar and wind is very good. What's happened in the industrial sector in terms of how do we make steel, how do we make cement, people have sort of gotten excited about the low-hanging fruit. Electric cars, that's the easy part. Uh, you still have to do the grid, but the various things, including industrial, are very, very difficult. Nuclear, you know, you get a million times as much energy per reaction as you do burning hydrocarbons, and so it's very advantaged if uh, you do the design right. I can't say for sure it would succeed, but it'd be good in this innovation portfolio. We have to have a lot of bets knowing that some of them uh, won't, won't succeed. And in that, you, I think your company, TerraPower, you, you think you've come up with a new design which would be safer and more efficient. Yeah, in the computer, our design is amazing. Uh, and that's beautiful because you can simulate earthquakes, volcanoes, you know, planes crashing into it, all sorts of things that none of the existing nuclear plants could you do any of that. And you can show that your costs uh, and inherent safety are very, very strong. We need to build a demo plant at one point, uh, and we plan to do that in China. Uh, the U.S. government decided uh, that we shouldn't do that. Uh, and so now, uh, the backup plan now is, is that we'll try and build that demo plant in the United States. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not an easy endeavor, but none of the paths to climate success uh, are risk-free. We'll come back to US-China in a second, but how frustrating was that for you? You put all this money into setting up this technology. You had the Chinese on board to test it, and the Trump administration stopped. Well, it's, it's frustrating because I'd gone for a decade meeting with every Secretary of Energy, you know, who'd encouraged us, and actually, you know, the U.S. government had created an agreement because you need explicit permission yep. to do this type of collaboration. And so it was a surprise when that was withdrawn, and it meant that a lot of things we had done, it was a setback. It, you know, in the very best case, it was a five-year delay. In the worst case, it was a... Uh, you know, completely collapsed it. It's a big theme of this conference, as I said, has been China and America. Um, earlier today, Henry Kissinger said, we were in the foothills of a Cold War. You, as long as I've known you, you have been a, there's a passionate advocate of engagement with China. How do, how do you view the current situation? I'm even more passionate about the value of engagement than ever. Uh, and, uh, you know, the last few years uh, have seen a lot of voices arguing against that, even arguing in some extreme cases for so-called decoupling. Uh, I think it's a benefit that there's interdependence. You know, the fact that we have uh, tourists from Japan, we have uh, from China, we have uh, students from China, we have companies, you know, that do research uh, in China. You know, Apple is the tech company that actually sells, the only tech company that actually sells a lot of products here in China. That interdependence can lead to more dialogue, more mutual understanding. Uh, and so to have people arguing against that uh, is definitely a, a serious concern. That was Bill Gates, Microsoft co-founder and co-chairman of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The new economy forum is being organized by Bloomberg Media Group. It's a division of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News. Also at the new economy forum, we caught up with Micron president and CEO Sanjay Mehrotra. He told Bloomberg's Manus Cranny how the company handles business with China amid trade tensions. So what I can tell you is that I'm here in Beijing and, you know, certainly this is a developing story. At this point, I don't have any specific comment to share with you on this. Well, let me push a little bit. I mean, have you had conversations with Wilbur Ross? Have you had, how would you describe the conversations you're having with, uh, with U.S. officials? 
So what I'll tell you, Anna says that you know we are a very large global company. We are well diversified. We are of course always engaging in conversations with the governments around the globe, and of course we have been in touch with U.S. administration on an ongoing basis over the years, and certainly in recent times as well, because our business in China is certainly important to us, and you know as part of that, you know we have definitely. Would you say uh, the conversations are constructive? Absolutely, our discussions with the administration are constructive. Yes. Okay. Uh, the one thing I was just reading a little bit more about what's going on here in China. The state are putting about 29 billion dollars into getting this country self-sufficient. Is that perhaps a bigger threat than the interim trade wars? Self-sufficiency for technology supremacy here is a number one on the agenda. So what I'll tell you is that the memory and storage products, DRAM and flash that Micron makes, these are extremely important. When you look at the trends today of 5G, IoT, autonomous, cloud computing, and in this. Backdrop with our technology innovation, the products that we bring to the customers here in China, we are really a very valued partner to those customers. Of course, Micron has a very rich history of 40 years, tremendous amount of innovation from the company, 40,000 patents generated over 40 years. So we are used to competition all around the globe. We, of course, continue to focus on bringing new products, new technologies to the benefit of customers around the globe, including the ones here in China. Okay. And, and there are challenges therein, from a production point of view. You've got to deal with the reality of a trade war. What I want to get a sense is how much additional production are you taking out of America and moving it into other global centres? Have you done that this year? Do you anticipate to do some of that next year? We actually have manufacturing of our leading edge DRAM and flash products around the globe. In US, we have manufacturing. We have not taken. Can any manufacturing out of the U.S.? In fact, our center, uh, our fab fabrication areas in Manassas, Virginia, is is the center of excellence for automotive products for us, where Micron has number one global market share. So we have a very well diversified global manufacturing footprint. Our supply chain is very resilient, very adaptive, and agile. And certainly, in these recent times, where you know there certainly have been some challenges on the global trade front. We have shown that you know we have been pretty resilient in terms of addressing the challenges and moving on, continuing to bring value of our products to our customers around the globe. That was Micron President and CEO Sanjay Mirotra. The new Economy Forum is being organized by Bloomberg Media Group. It is a division of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News. And coming up, an FCC commissioner says other countries are making strides in 5G and the U.S. risks falling behind without a master plan. That's next. This is Bloomberg. More on the race to advance 5G networks, FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel thinks there are many ways to make 5G services available, but both the FCC and the government administration are still figuring out the best solution to make that happen. She spoke to Bloomberg's David Weston a bit earlier. As we move to 5G, we are going to need more airwaves to power that next generation of wireless services. And some of those airwaves are in a really sweet spot known as mid-band airwaves. And that C-band you're talking about is right there. But over time, the FCC allocated those airwaves to a lot of satellite services. And we may have, in fact, offered so much of those airwaves to satellite services that they could return some of them now and make them available for new terrestrial uses for wireless. And that's what's at issue here. What's the best way to make that happen? For a while, the FCC was exploring a private sale of those airwaves. But increasingly, it has started to look legally complicated, hard to do, and Capitol Hill has been involved and suggested that we should do this through a public auction. As a result, the FCC chairman has announced that he would prefer a public auction next year, 
And we are going to work with folks on Capitol Hill to see if we can do just that. Okay, turn to one other dispute that came up within the last two or three weeks, and that's the six gigahertz dispute, as I understand it, which appears to be Wi-Fi on the one hand, companies like Broadcom on the one hand, versus utilities who say they really need that spectrum for emergency communication. What is that dispute about? Yeah. You know, our airwaves, again, are getting complicated. And when you have an existing use and you propose new uses, there tends to be some friction. And you're seeing that here. Unlicensed spectrum or Wi-Fi is a really important part of our economy. So we're looking for places to grow Wi-Fi. And the 6 gigahertz band is definitely one of the places we'd like to do it because it's adjacent to existing unlicensed spectrum used for Wi-Fi. There are, however, utilities that rely on that band. So we're going to have to figure out how we might be able to do both more unlicensed and Wi-Fi, along with protect those in utility activities from unreasonable interference. So the FCC started a proceeding on that, but it is um, admittedly a heated one. We're still having discussions about it. And we're also looking at other places for Wi-Fi to go, including the 5.9 gigahertz band, which is just nearby. We're talking with FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. Give us a sense about the extent to which partisan politics enters into this. We have both Republicans and Democrats who are commissioners on the FCC. President Trump has said it is a priority for the country to go into 5G. How much of this is a Republican-Democrat issue? How much of it is the Republicans and Democrats basically united on the goal of advancing 5G as fast as we can? Oh, I think you've got it. We're united on the goal. We want the United States to lead when it comes to this next generation of wireless technology. But I think when it comes to tactics, we might differ. I'm the senior Democrat at the agency, and I think when I look at the administration right now, we don't have a master plan for 5G service. And in fact, you saw leadership from the Senate, right, the National Security Advisor in the White House just this week, and say, we need a master plan when it comes to 5G. We don't have one. We've got the FCC fighting with the Department of Commerce over airwaves, fighting with the Department of Transportation over airwaves. And we've got the president tweeting out that he's asked Tim Cook for assistance with 5G. This is not a master plan, and we need one. Other economies around the world are making strides, and we don't want to fall behind. That was FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. And still ahead, Tesla's EV lineup is about to get a new addition. We bring you the details of their new secret vehicle. That's next. This is Bloomberg. After months of secrecy, Tesla is getting set to unveil its electric pickup truck late on Thursday. Up until now, the only glimpse the public has had of the new vehicle was a cryptic looking tweet from CEO Elon Musk. For more details on what to expect, let's head on over to Detroit, where Bloomberg auto reporter Chester Dawson joins us. Chester, why trucks? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, Elon Musk has been talking about it for years, and it's one of the more anticipated uh, items to come out of uh, Tesla's uh, skunk works. But, um, you know, it's a very lucrative market. Uh, the Detroit Three make most of their money uh, from pickups, uh, particularly Ford Motor, who has the best-selling pickup. So um, if you're an automaker, uh, there's some bragging rights, but it also is a big profit uh, generator. Chester, it's a big profit generator, but it is also a closely held loyal, loyal, loyal market. I think you had in the story that about 92% of that truck market share is owned by the Detroit 3. How does Tesla plan to make inroads? Well, we don't quite know um, yet. Uh, it does sound like the vehicle is going to look a little different than your traditional truck, although we'll, we'll find out later tonight. Um, but, you know, the company has been pretty successful in the sedan market of creating a, a you know, buzz around its vehicles, a new market. I mean, really nobody is in the electric truck space yet, so they might have an advantage because of their prowess in electric cars. Uh, but as you say, you know, 90% of the market is of the truck market is uh, kind of locked up by the Detroit 3. So it'll be a big fight um, and very uh, interesting to watch. Do you think that buyers of these vehicles would be Tesla lovers or truck lovers? 
That's a good question. I think, um, at least initially, um, most expect them to be Tesla lovers, uh, but longer term, they're going to need to crack into that broader market, um, you know, where the Japanese have struggled for years trying to, to reach um, truck buyers who are very loyal and want a lot of performance out of their vehicles. Um, you know, even people who don't take their truck and use it to tow things or, or move lumber or other things, they, they want to feel as if the truck could do that. So it really is a, a a performance heavy market and Tesla's going to have to show that the truck can um, not only show up but put up. Chester, I wonder if now is the right time. Analysts were so happy when Tesla finally was able to turn a profit. Now they're going to be investing more in trucks and in a factory to build the trucks. Is now really the right time? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, they have this um, new Model Y crossover that they're just about to launch. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the Tesla semi-truck, a much larger vehicle. So, I mean, I, I think it's kind of almost like an Amazon.com uh, thing where, you know, Tesla wants to flood the zone to get as many products out there, um, you know, as soon as it can um, and try to lock up, you know, whatever advantage there is to being an early mover in the market for electric pickup trucks and, and other vehicles. Um, but it does raise questions for investors about how they're going to be able to generate profits sustainably. Obviously, if they get a big chunk of the early market, that's a good sign. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an open question as to whether they need to be moving just uh, as, as fast as they are. And on the questions of profitability, I mean, we know that the Model 3 was a volume over margin story, but the S and the X were more focused on profitability and selling fewer of them, but at a higher cost. Can we assume as well within the composition mix of Tesla that the truck would be in that category fewer, but higher margin? I think that's right, and, and Musk himself has um, kind of downplayed the idea that this is going to be a, a, a huge volume vehicle, at least at the outset. Um, and it's true that for high-end trucks, I mean, you know, you're like the Ford Raptor. I mean, that type of vehicle sells for you know close to six figures. So um, in, in that area of the market, it really is a matter of margin over um, uh, volume. And uh, it, it sounds like the truck uh, from Tesla will be very much um, more like the Model S and X than the Model 3. Bloomberg's Chester Dawson, thanks for joining. Now, the sixth season of Formula E kicks off this weekend in Saudi Arabia, where the slickest and fastest all-electric vehicles will battle outside Riyadh in a race lasting 45 minutes and one lap. And it will all be powered by a company base more than 8,000 miles away. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow explains. Zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds, with a top speed of 174 miles an hour, and all from an electric motor. This is Formula E, the all-electric cousin of Formula One. When the street racing series started in 2014, the cars couldn't complete the race on a single charge. But since last season, that's changed. Green in Monaco. And it's thanks to this battery pack, built by a Californian company called Lucid. We used our proprietary expertise, particularly in thermal uh, modelling and thermal control, in, in structural analyses, in packaging, we tested it, and we actually manufacture it here in this very building at our headquarters in Silicon Valley. Season 5 in 2018 was the first time Lucid supplied battery packs for Formula E through its technology arm, Ativa. But under the arrangement, their involvement was kept confidential and they were labelled as a so-called battery partner of racing giant McLaren. This year is a different story and Lucid is taking the spotlight and will continue to do so until their contract expires after Season 8 in 2021. So what can Formula E fans expect? Bloomberg got an exclusive look under the hood of Lucid's latest battery designs. They say the trapezium shape and in-house management software is what will help the teams go the distance. But for Lucid, the Formula E deal is actually just a small part of a much bigger plan. It generates a modest revenue, but really it's a token. The real reason we're doing this is to demonstrate that we have world-class technology, which will find its way into our forthcoming road car. The Lucid Air is a luxury consumer EV designed to compete against the likes of Tesla and Porsche's electric offering. Production of the vehicle won't begin until the end of 2020, but in the meantime, engineers are building prototypes in small batches at their Newark factory. 
The focus has been on making the battery packs as lightweight and efficient as possible using proprietary robotics and scanning technology to increase battery density. Bloomberg NEF says Lucid's Formula E battery pack has 20% more battery density than the nearest consumer EV. What Lucid's done with its Formula E packs has made them incredibly light and increased the energy density beyond what's commercially available at the moment. So if Lucid can transfer this technology to commercial electric vehicles, it could give them a real advantage when compared to other EVs on the market. Lucid also says there's potential to sell the battery pack technology to other automakers or form partnerships. For now, they hope their work for Formula E will put them in pole position to capture the consumer EV market in 2020. Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg News, Newark, California. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.